taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in God. Fear the Lord, you God's holy people. For those who fear God lack nothing. Lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Good morning and welcome to worship with Hillier Memorial Christian Church. It is a joy to be together in worship this morning. We want to wish a happy Father's Day to all those fathers out there. And we also want to extend a special welcome to any visitors who might be watching with us for the first time, perhaps this morning. We are so grateful that you are joining us for this time of worship, and we would love an opportunity to connect with you, to get to know you, perhaps outside of this virtual space. If you want to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself, or perhaps a way we can be praying for you, we invite you to send us an email at info at hillierchurch.org. We look forward to connecting with you later in the week. We invite everybody to gather some communion elements as we'll be spending some time at the table later today. And also invite those who are regular attenders to consider supporting Hillier's mission and ministry by giving of your tithes and offerings. You can give online at any time at hillierchurch.org slash give. We are excited to announce that Gary will be returning from his Mediterranean travels in the coming week. He'll be back in the office midweek and back with us in the pulpit on Sunday morning. I want to say a special word of thanks to all those who have helped in this time while Gary was away, whether helping us lead in worship, as many of our retired clergy have done, or those like the elders and so many others who have stepped up behind the scenes to meet needs as they arose. We are really grateful for your partnership in ministry. May we be in a spirit of prayer. O oh, loving God, we give thanks for your countless blessings in our lives, as well as for the miracles of your creation. Whatever our needs may be this morning, you are here to surround us with your compassion and care. Turn us now towards you to remember your provision for us and recognize your grace in our lives. When we are unsure of what the future holds, remind us of the direction you have already given us. Soothe us with your presence that we may grow in trust for your purpose in our lives. Guide us forward to abide in your love and faithfulness. Like the Israelites of old who were provided manna from heaven sufficient for the day, you also provide for us today our daily needs. Through Jesus Christ, you have given us enough. Enough love, enough hope, enough peace, enough light. May we be ever mindful to share from the abundance of our blessings. Awaken us, your people, to hear the cries of those in need and embolden us to share your love in tangible ways to others. A word of kindness, an act of forgiveness, a generous spirit are all ways we can share with those who are hurting in our world. On this Father's Day, we give thanks for fathers and for all those who have been like fathers to us. We celebrate the love and guidance they have given us. And for those who need fatherly love, surround them with your comforting presence. Today, we also off offer prayers for those who are hurting for those who are ill, for those who are grieving, for those who feel alone and hopeless because of life's circumstances. May they know of your abiding care and faithfulness. Enfold us now in your loving presence. This we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from John chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. 
Some time after this, Jesus crossed the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish festival of Passover was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Then Jesus took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed them to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I was in college, I had the opportunity to spend a summer in Romania. Romania is one of the most religious countries in Eastern Europe, and around 85% or so of the country's population identifies as Romanian Orthodox. While I was there, I got to learn quite a bit about the Orthodox Church. I got to visit monasteries, read books, talk with an Orthodox scholar, but the most significant learning for me happened while attending Orthodox churches on Sundays. Over the weeks, I learned quite a bit about Orthodox churches and the ways that they're similar and different from Protestant churches in the West. Of the things that were different, one was the length of the service. Services can be hours and hours long. But the other difference is most people don't actually show up when the service begins but instead come somewhere midway through the service. I also learned that most churches don't have pews, so people stand for the entire service, which may be a contributing factor for why people don't show up at the beginning. The other thing I learned was that unlike our practice in disciples' congregations, the Orthodox Church has some pretty strict rules around who is allowed to partake of communion. Thankfully, I was aware of this before I started attending churches and was very intentional to not take communion while I was there. And then, one week, to my great surprise, as service was ending, somebody walked up to me and pressed a piece of bread into my hands and indicated that I should eat it. I tried to refuse. I knew I wasn't supposed to take communion. But this person insisted, and not knowing what else to do, I ate it, and nobody seemed particularly offended. Only afterwards did I learn that what had been given to me was called blessed bread. It's not the same bread that's been consecrated for communion, but it comes from the same loaf. And it's given out at the end of the service, often to non-members as a sign of Christian fellowship and of love. As a guest in that community who really wanted 
to respect the theological convictions of the church I was worshiping in. When I was offered the blessed bread, it felt like such a warm gesture of hospitality. And I've been thinking about that hospitality as I've reflected on the feeding of the 5,000 over this past week or so. In our scripture reading today, a great crowd of people interrupt Jesus's more intimate conversation with his disciples. And yet, despite the interruption, Jesus doesn't get offended and doesn't respond with frustration. Jesus looks into their faces and sees a very human need. The people are hungry. And Jesus responds by wondering how he might get something for them to eat. Disciples are much more practical. Philip looks at the crowd, does a little bit of multiplication, and realizes the staggering cost of even securing enough food for everyone to have a single bite. Andrew has come up with five loaves and two fish from a youth's lunch. And then he does some quick division. Five loaves divided by 5,000 hungry people isn't looking very good. Disciples are just being practical. It's not possible, Jesus, to feed that many people, no matter how much we might like to. But young people and Jesus rarely let how things are supposed to work get in the way of meeting a basic human need that's standing right in front of them. And so together, they partner. The youth offers his lunch, and Jesus invites everyone to sit down. And then, taking the loaf, Jesus gives thanks for it. This little bit that they do have breaks it and begins giving the bread to all who are hungry. The crowd takes it, eats the bread, and are satisfied. There's no pushing or shoving. There's no gorging. Everyone is able to have what they want. And in the end, all have enough. All have enough. Despite the massive need, despite the apparent lack of resources. When Jesus sees the need and the youth comes forward to share what, he's, what he has, Everyone has enough. Enough. That word is still so striking to me, even after all these work weeks thinking about it. It makes it clear that no one left this meal hungry. The need was filled. People were satisfied. They were able to take as much as they wanted. But it also doesn't sound like this meal put anyone into a food coma. Nobody had to be rolled down the mountain to get home. No one even takes a doggy bag home with leftovers. The disciples have to pick it up later. And it all started because someone was willing to share. And somebody else gave thanks. Could it really be that simple? Initially, I had wanted to start this week's sermon with a story about how my dad would always share a pretzel with me and my sister when we were little. and We'd go shopping at the mall. It is Father's Day, after all. And that's a particularly fond childhood memory. A time when my dad, my sister and I all broke bread together. But... As I reflected, I wondered if another lesson in sharing from my childhood was even more important. When I was in elementary school, my mom began donating 
things that my sister and I had outgrown. High chairs, cribs, baby toys, and other equipment. She would take me and my sister and drive us with the trunk full of things we'd outgrown to Leanne McGrath's house. Leanne would open her big garage doors and help us unload our things. Others people's donations were already there. And mom would explain to us that Leanne would help make sure that the things we just gave would go to somebody who needed them. Leanne had started all of this when she met a new family with an infant. And this family would put their baby to bed in a dresser drawer because they didn't have a crib for him. Leanne looked around her home, looked at the homes of her neighbors, and saw that they all had a lot, perhaps more than enough. And Leanne began wondering what would happen if they started sharing what they had. She started with Chris, but by the time we met her, Leanne was sharing all manner of household goods. People were so willing to share, and the need was so great that Leanne's garage was filled and emptied three times a day. Eventually, she realized she needed a bigger space, and she needed a name to describe what was happening, what she was about. And so she chose the name Sharing Connection because she felt it was her job to help facilitate a sharing between people so that everyone could have enough. What started as a single crib has now become an organization that has helped tens of thousands of families eat at a table and sleep in a bed. Our series over this month has been called Enough. But I would be remiss if I didn't name that the Bible also talks about abundance. There are lots of books you can read, popular preachers you can listen to, who will tell you about how God wants to give us more than we can imagine. And I believe that's true. But I don't think that the Bible is usually talking about material possessions. And it talks about abundance. I'm going to guess that the youth who shared his lunch never got to eat the whole of what his mother or father had packed for him that day. But because he was willing to share, he got to witness a miracle. He didn't know when he offered it what would happen to the food. And it certainly didn't seem like much when faced with this overwhelming need. But still, the youth offered what he had. This congregation is pretty used to responding to overwhelming need by giving what we have. We participate in Rise Against Hunger to combat global food insecurity. One by one, we help to make homes warmer, safer, and drier with ASP. We pack Church World Service hygiene kits for survivors of natural disaster. We bike on Team Trevelyan to end MS. We walk with Team Tatum to defeat ALS. It can seem like such small things when the need is so great. But like the youth who shared his lunch, we aren't working alone. And a congregation that loves to serve as much as this one, perhaps we need the reminder that it's not our work alone that makes the difference. It's what happens when we partner with Jesus. Jesus, whose first response is gratitude. Before the miracle, before all had eaten and were satisfied, Jesus gives 
thanks. Even in the face of such great need and such few loaves, Jesus doesn't call on God for more, but instead gives thanks for what is. And it's Jesus' prayer of thanksgiving that the people remember when they retell the story later in the chapter. It's not just about the sharing, although that is important. And it's not just about partnering with Jesus, although that is indispensable. To truly live lives marked by enough, we must also give thanks for what is. Living lives marked by gratitude reframes how we see the world. It's an antidote for our tendency to always strive for more because it allows us to be content with what we have. Gratitude helps us see that what we have is enough. It helps us to share joyfully because we remember how much has been given to us. It's a spiritual discipline, perhaps one of the most powerful ones, because it lays the foundation for how we view the whole rest of our lives. As we close this series on enough, I want to leave you with an image. When you think about trusting God to provide mourning by morning, when you think about the courage and the trust that it takes to stop and to rest, when you think about cultivating gratitude so that you can be confident that you have enough to share, I invite you to picture open hands, clenched fists, hold on to whatever they already have. But while they're busy doing that, they're unable to receive anything else. Open hands, hold loosely to whatever comes. Things may come and rest in them for a time and then move on. And that's okay because open hands recognize that it was never theirs to begin with. And because the hands are open, they're able to receive unexpected gifts when they come. As we end this series on enough with open hands, may you receive these words. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. In Christ, there is enough. In Christ, you are enough. There is no scarcity in the kingdom of God. Everyone has just the right amount. And no one goes without. Thanks be to God. Bye.
gonna have to sow the seed Plant a little happiness Let the roots run deep If it's love that we give Then it's love that we read If we want to go At this table, Jesus offers enough for each one of us. To remind ourselves of this, I offer to us this blessing by Jan Richardson. And the table will be wide. And the welcome will be wide. And the arms will open wide to gather us in and our hearts will open wide to receive. And we will come as children who trust there is enough. We will come unhindered and free. And our aching will be met with bread and our sorrow will be met with wine. And we will open our hands to feast without shame. And we will turn toward each other without fear. And we will give up our appetite for despair. And we will taste and know delight. And we will become bread for a hungering world. And we will become drink for those who thirst. And the blessed will become a blessing. And everywhere will be a feast. Thanks be to God. Builder of all things, we are so grateful that the cornerstone of our church is your Son, Jesus Christ. May we as individual members be in perfect unity through Him and your Word to do the work you would have us to do. May our love for you and for each other and for those outside the church be sincere. May we be devoted to one another in brotherly love and be guided by your Holy Spirit as we worship together as one body and as we witness to others. May we be in one accord as we come to your table to remember the sacrifice your son, Jesus Christ, made for us that we might have life through him. In his name we pray, amen. And so we remember the story. On that night when Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks for it and broke it, saying, this is my body, it was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. Thanks be to God. In gratitude for the many gifts we receive at this table, let us join our hearts and our voices in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive now this benediction. As partners with Christ, may we go forth into the world with the courage to share what has been given to us, trusting that in Christ there is always enough. Thank you, friends. It is a gift to be in worship with you. I invite you, if you know someone who could use this message of hope and encouragement today, to share it with them, to share it with your broader group of friends on your Facebook page so that we can remind each other that in Christ there is enough. Go in peace.